Good afternoon, everyone. Um, apologies, we started three minutes late today. Please wave if you can hear me. Thank you so much. That is uh, good that you can hear us. So just a brief recap about last week's sessions. It was a session, it was actually an ad hoc session. We we're talking about COVID-19. As you know, ECHO is initially meant for HIV and TB, but because we're in a pandemic situation that was declared on the 11th of March, we have dedicated most of our ECHO sessions to COVID. So I think we're going to today's presentation. Today we have three experts because we are talking about the urgent things in uh, COVID, which is triaging of our patients. How will we manage our patients living with HIV that are chronically infected? What should we do at facility level? And how do we do hand washing? So on the panel, we have um, Mrs. Lastina Luatula, who will demonstrate hand washing. We have Dr. Nyuma Mbewe, who will do donning and doffing of personal protective equipment. She's an infectious disease registrar. We also, also have Dr. Keith Mwewo from CDC Zambia. We'll also be joined by experts, Dr. Kasidi and Dr. Pachamwa. So we'll go into today's presentation. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the learning objectives for this afternoon session is that we need to be able to understand why triaging patients is very important in relation to COVID-19. Then, as Dr. Koloshi mentioned, we'll talk about the proper hand washing techniques, the proper techniques for donning and doffing PPE. Very important if you want to reduce um, healthcare worker mortalities. And then lastly, the management of people living. So before we go into the importance of triaging clients in relation to COVID-19, uh, we'll go to our first poll question. Which of the following is false concerning triaging? Which one is false? Healthcare workers should don full PPE when triaging patients in the ART clinic. B. Healthcare workers should be seated at least one or two meters from recipients of care. E C, give the suspect patient with acute respiratory illness a, med a, a, a surgical mask. D, e, all individuals entering the triage area should observe hand hygiene, which is not true. You can call. If we're able to watch. Okay, so you can please go ahead and vote. I'll read that again. Which of the following is not true? A, healthcare workers should don full PPE when triaging of patients in an ART clinic. B, healthcare workers should be seated at least one to two meters from recipients of care. C, give the, sus give the suspect with acute respiratory illness a surgical mask, D, all individuals <coughs> entering the triage area should observe hand hygiene, which one is not true? So um, we'll go ahead and end the polling. Please. Okay, so you have those interesting uh, answers. <laughs> which one is not true? Which one is false? Is it not true that people should wash their hands when they enter the charging area? Should we give people who are coughing and sneezing surgical masks? Or is it that healthcare workers should don the whole full PPE even when triaging uh, patients? And this repeated at the end. Eh? I'll end the polling. Thank you so much for all support. We'll discuss, we'll discuss this later. Okay, so when we talk about triaging clients, this is um, at any outpatient or inpatient area, you need to triage clients to see those who have acute respiratory symptoms and see whether or not they need to go for further screening for COVID-19. So the importance of this is because you want to, risk, to reduce the risk of spreading the infection to other patients who have come for other health 
health uh, seeking reasons at the facility. And then it's also important to prioritize any sick clients to ensure that um, they're not in contact with uh, the COVID cases and any suspected cases will be treated and isolated from them. And additionally, triage helps you um, fast track certain clients so that you avoid overcrowding in the facility. So in terms of triage, it should be done um, ideally every during this um, pandemic, every person who is entering the facility should be seen. This is not just the client seeking care, but also their family members who are coming accompanying them. As you know, most Zambians always don't come to the facility alone, and some people are asymptomatic, so they might not be presenting with acute um, cough or anything, but you need to screen them as well. Additionally, staff members. In fact, staff members are very important because we get into contact with different clients, so every day as we come to the facilities, we need to be screened. And then the screening can actually be done by any member of staff. It doesn't have to be the nurse or the doctor. Um, for the, the distant facilities, anyone who can use, um, who can be oriented in the screening tool can be stationed at a gate to screen the, the, the clients. So anyone who has used the TV screening tool before, I think in TV we've used um, office orderlies and uh, community health assistants before, even security guards have been used for screening purposes at the gate. And then the, num the idea is that you want to control your numbers. Um, in places where you have a lot of people waiting at the gate, that's not a conducive environment. So that's also a reason why triaging is important at the, at the screening, at the entrance of the facility and also at the same waiting. Okay, so this is um, just a flow chart of how you can screen your healthcare workers, I mean, your clients and um, healthcare workers. So once a client comes, they sh ideally right at the gate, there should be a facility for washing hands or hand sanitation right at the gate. Uh, most of our private hospitals do have, but I think like UTH, I didn't see one this morning. Um, anyway, so the, when we say screening, it's not like you're examining the patient, you're just asking for the main symptoms and the main things that fit with the epidemiological criteria for COVID. The things we're interested in is, have they traveled out of the country in the last 14 days? Um, we've stopped asking specifically about China or travel to a particular high-risk countries because now almost every country is reporting um, COVID cases. I think in Southern Africa, only Botswana and Mozambique don't have cases. So any travel out of the country would warrant further questioning. Then you also want to find out that if they haven't traveled, have they been in contact with any visitor who's been out of the country in the last 14 days? And then lastly, we want to find out if they've been with a, an actual contact of someone who's a suspect or if they had a probable or a, confer, a confirmed case of COVID. Um, if they don't have any of those initial screening questions, then you would proceed to screen them for the symptoms of things like cough, a sore throat, shortness of breath, and uh, fever. If they don't have, if they have no to both the symptom screen and the travel screen, then that that patient, that client would have no COVID exposure. However, if they do, it means they might have some other respiratory infection. Remember, TB is still common in our setting, and right now a lot of people have flus, so it's still important that you want to have that patient assessed for any other respiratory infection. On the other hand, if we say that the person had been in contact with uh, someone who had traveled out of the country or perhaps they themselves had traveled out of the country and they had um, positive answers when we did the symptom screen, that person needs to be provided with a mask because that's a COVID suspect that needs to undergo further testing or further symptom screen regarding COVID. But if you feel that that person did not meet the symptom screen for COVID, then they have a possible exposure you need to advise that person to self-isolate for 14 days at home. And when we talk about self-isolation, it means everybody in that house should be isolated, not whereby the husband comes home and he's isolating in the bedroom, but then the wife brings him meals and still goes to work, or the maid comes and still goes back to her compound. So it's very important when we explain to our clients the parameters of self-isolation, it's the whole household. Thank you so much, Dr. Newman. We're now going to talk about hand hygiene. As we are preparing, please take note that in the next two weeks, um, based on tomorrow, they are launching the, the World TV Day, 
facilities will be screening for TB extensively. Please make sure you also check for epidemiological link, meaning that you check if they have traveled or not. So we have our next poll question. True or false? I hope everybody can see that and I don't have to read it twice. Whoa, one person answered and they got 100%. <laughs> okay, hand washing is the single most important procedure to limit the spread of infections such as COVID-19. Hand washing is the single most important procedure to limit the spread of COVID-19. What do we think? Is it the most, is it the greatest invasion in the infectious disease? The greatest intervention is essentially what they're saying. Is it the most important? Or there is something you can think of that's more important in infectious disease in terms of spread, especially when you think of COVID-19. That's how you may want to think about this question. We have some interesting results. I'll allow people to take a minute. Focus on the thing. So we we'll have three seconds. So these are our answers. This is an interesting one because I didn't know this until I had my infectious disease training. So, okay. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge that uh, we know that uh, all facilities are. Um, practicing social distancing. I know there's a question whether it's one or two meters. The World Health Organization says one meter. Studies have shown that one meters are safe. You are far from droplets. Our CDC is very cautious and recommends two meters. So let's make sure that as we join in, we are practicing social distancing. Not that I'm saying don't go to work, eh? because some are concerning one in the hub. One in the spoke, is that social distancing or absenteeism now? Anyhow, let's make sure we are one meter apart, even as we're attending this session. COVID is a very serious disease. Um, so thank you all for all that code. We'll go. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, Zambia is, is Zambia's health is in our hands, and as healthcare workers, hand washing has a very special place because it is the most important and single infection prevention procedures, as it removes soil and debris from the skin and the number of uh, microorganisms, including the novel 2019. Uh, Virus. So we are supposed to be washing our hands before and after patient care, before and after using gloves. When you use gloves, it doesn't mean that your hands remain clean because uh, they are also porous to some of the microorganisms. Uh, and then we need to wash our hands between patient contact. And then, of, of course, when the hands are physically Note that hands, uh, you must protect your hands from dryness with petroleum free creams. And also, please, please do not use artificial nails or wraps when you are in contact with patients, as well as nail polish. So, there are very simple steps in washing hands, but for us as healthcare providers, we have to wash our hands in a special way. So the first step is that you thoroughly wet your hands with clean water, and then apply plain soap or detergent, then rub all areas of the hand, paying particular attention uh, to fingers for about 10 to 15 seconds. And then also you rinse your hands thoroughly with clean running water from a tap or a bucket. Remember also that um, you must dry your hands with a paper towel 
and the use of uh, a towel which is made of cotton between uh, a lot of people is also not uh, advisable. And then last, you must air dry your hands if at all you have no towels at all. So I'm just going to demonstrate to you uh, how to wash hands. So you need water in the bucket, and then I have a liquid soap here, and then I have my uh, paper towel on the side. So the first step is that you Thank you. Thank you. So the first step is that you must thoroughly wet your hands like that. Thoroughly, because if you don't do that, the soap will not wet properly. And then you squeeze an adequate amount of soap, and then you, you rub like that between the fingers, outer aspects of the hands, and you lock your hands to make sure that you wash the nails and also the, uh, the lines in the palm. Then you come, after you come, in inside the park, then lastly, the fist. Then you wash thoroughly. Make sure that you rinse the soap thoroughly. When you are done, don't close the tap yet. Set the hand towel and dry, starting with the inside, hands, and outside. Then start out. Oh, sorry. So that's finished. Now, I'm also going to demonstrate to you how to make uh, or to reconstitute a hand wrap at home or even in our facilities because we may not have the luxury of having a ready-made hand wrap. I have one here, but I just want to demonstrate to you very easily. So I have here two ingredients only. I have methylated spirit, and then I have glycerin. So what you do is you take 10 mils of glycerin, At eye level, I'm going to measure. Or in my clean container. Then methylated spirit, 30 mils of this one. And you just mix this nicely. Once it is mixed, then you can use it. about this. I'm going to use the already reconstituted uh, agent. So what you do first is you make sure that the fingertips are sanitized and then you go again using the same maneuvers okay, in the palm, uh, uh, in between the fingers, again in the outer aspect. And the idea here is you want to reach all parts of the hand. 
so that they are nicely wet. And because we are not wiping the we are not wiping the hand sanitizer, it has to dry. So you must keep on rubbing until the hand sanitizer dries on your hands. Now, when you use hand sanitizer, you must remember all the time that you must wash hands between five to 10 applications so that you avoid the accumulation of microorganisms on your hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Madam Plastina. That was very useful. But we'll give you minus one mm -hmm. for having something dangly around your neck. Oh, <laughs> as your care workers, it's better we don't have yes, virtual should, things. We are all wearing danglings, but just shows you that we're not touching patients. But it's not advisable. But thank you so much. I guess we do not have to go through this. No, that's okay. not necessary. And because uh, I already said everything. I believe for hand rub, you don't have to have your hands should not be um, obviously dirty, so and obviously oily. So they should be relatively clean before you venture into that. And I, I believe there's also a socioeconomic aspect to this because hand rubs are now very expensive. Yes. I know there is efforts to step in and make sure that uh, consumer protection has stepped in. Maybe we'll discuss that a bit later. But things are very expensive now that we have a pandemic, which is not supposed to be. Yes. OK, so we'll go to our Third poor question. Um, which of the following is appropriate IP and control practice for COVID-19 patients in healthcare settings? A form hand hygiene before and after each contact with patient and contaminated surfaces. Always use a particulate respirator when performing aerosol generating procedures. Apply contact precautions at all times. Okay. Ah. Let's think through that. Please go ahead and what? What do we think is the answer? Thank you so much. Okay, so a few people are appalling. Okay. Okay, so those are the, I'm sure we can all see, they have, they have, they are very quiet. I think we'll ask Richard Tonda, even I <laughs> should know these things, isn't it? Because <laughs> we are in a pandemic, so all of us are affected, actually. Which of the following is appropriate infection, prevention, and control practice for COVID-19 patients in healthcare settings? You should perform hand hygiene before and after each contact with patients and contaminated surfaces. Always use a particulate respirator, like a N95 mask, when performing aerosol generating procedures. These are things like such as intubation. Apply contact precautions at all times, and people feel all the above. So there are some people who feel that the most important. <laughs> That's mean you can break the rules, Chatonda. You keep the answer in your heart. <laughs> okay. So I'm a bit unable to share the post, so I'll just close it. Okay, so now we have Dr. Numa Bewe who will talk about personal protective equipment, PPE. I know since we're in the pandemic, we're all panicking. We are calling it PEP most of the time. It's PPE. Please go ahead. We have uh, Mrs. Makupe to assist you. Okay. Um... So we are using the protocol from CDC and the procedures for how to put on the personal uh, protective equipment. I will ask you to come forward. I think one of the things that I would like to emphasize is the points at which we should put on the PPE. There's a slide that we will show later on the appropriate points at, at, upon which you should put on PPE. Because it's not every um, interaction with the patient which needs you to put on, put on the full PPE. Um, I think earlier on we were talking about triaging, and remember we said that you're triaging from at least a meter away from patients, some of whom have come in with TB and not really COVID-19, so you don't actually need to put on full PPE when triaging. So just to start with, we're talking about putting on the PPE when you're actually 
doing, as Dr. Boroshi said, aerosol generating procedure. So in our case, uh, if you, for example, are swabbing the, the patient, it's not really generating aerosols, but since it's such a close contact, we are considering that to be one of the situations in which you would use the full PP. So there's actually two different options in terms of the full cover. There's the overall cover and the gown. At the, the, the screening centers at UTH and Levy, right now we're using the gown. So we'll start with a demonstration with the gown. Then some of the other things in terms of the full PPE set that you need, uh, the goggles for eye protection. We'll talk a bit about the different face um, protections. So we have the face mask and the N95 mask. And um, I'm sure in most medical groups this morning, there was that uh, article or that news report that says breaking news, COVID is airborne. And apparently WHO has declared COVID airborne. But if you try and look for the source of that breaking news, we actually haven't found the official source of that news. So what's on the WHO page is that COVID-19 is still classified as droplet spread infection which is why we are not going to say that everybody should be wearing PPEs at all the points. Um, obviously, different settings in the hospital require different levels of protection, but I just thought it was important to highlight the fact that as at right now, I don't know, maybe as I'm talking, it changes. As at, as at now, it's still classified as being droplet spray. And that's also important to note because a lot of people are wearing N95 masks, but if you don't, um, if your NH5 mask is not fit tested, it means that you're not really achieving the, the purpose of the mask. So you have a lot of people wearing masks which are bigger than their heads and things like that. So when we say fit tested, there's actually a specific procedure, uh, particularly used, for example, in the TV world, when you put on a mask, it should be the correct size for your face. If you have a beard, like a gentleman, that's one of the things that would make your NH5 mask not fit. And so the difference between the N95 and the face mask comes in the size of the droplets. If you look at the size of the COVID droplet, I can't remember the exact size of the dimensions, but the point is that the N95 mask is able to protect you from even the smallest droplet. I think it keeps out 95% of the particles in the air, which is where the N95 name comes from. However, if you are wearing an N95 mask, which is not pitch tested, which means it's not your right size, some of those particles are going to enter um, maybe if I go back to the point on fit testing, when you're being fit tested, they put a hood on your face, over your head rather, and then different chemicals are sprayed. And if you can spray it, if you can smell the chemical, it means that your mask is not working. So you're not supposed to smell whatever they're spraying. But then since most of us are just buying these masks and they're not fit tested, it means that some droplets or some particles will still enter. And then the problem with that is it, it gives you a false sense of security to think that I'm wearing this mask and I'm being protected from all airborne things, when in actual fact, you're not. And then additionally, an N95 mask is only supposed to be worn for, 40, for four hours before it gets soiled. But you'll find that maybe your hospital doesn't have, you're wearing the same N95 for the whole week, putting it in your pocket, holding it, things like that, that will destroy the integrity of that mask and then hence ruin giving you this full sense of protection, which we can even But anyway, I digress. Yes. <laughs> but back, okay. back to the, uh, the PPE. Donning. The donning, rather. So I'll ask Mrs. Makupe. The first thing that she needs to put on is the gown. Um, ideally, when you're donning, if you're going to be interacting with the patients who you are doing further screening for COVID or any, any droplet infection, you would want to have a partner because you can't, when you don, you need to have your partner to check that you're completely, you're wearing everything right. I think one of the issues in Ebola was that uh, healthcare workers were rushing into the centers, they would just put on their stuff without checking that everything was right. So then they didn't have complete protection. And I suspect, haven't been to Italy, but I suspect that in cases where healthcare workers are rushing into save their patients without putting on their PPE properly. So th this is, why putting on PPE properly is one of the crucial points, but then you have to remember to use it at the correct point because we shouldn't forget that we're a resource limited country. If we finish all the limited stocks of full PPEs before the, the pandemic really hits us properly, later on we'll be faced with a situation where we don't have PPEs and people either rush in unprotected or just stop seeing patients, which is the last penny. 
Anyway, so back to the dog. You have your partner. Your partner can ideally should have, even before I touched it, we should have washed our hands. Uh, the most important thing, I think, as Madam Lestina was explaining, is washing hands. So there's a lot of hand washing in donning and even in doffing. Hand washing steps are very important. So when you enter, when you have your facility, there should be a separate room for donning, which is ideally where you become sterile. And then the room where you take off the PPE is what we're calling doffing, which again should be in a separate room. So when we both enter the room, we need to wash our hands. Uh, the full, the full 20 seconds, and then I can help you put on your gown. It shouldn't touch the floor. So Chatonda, we have a request, and I 100% agree. Let's put it on full screen so that people can appreciate because they are seeing that part of my screen. Oh, okay. So they want a bigger screen. Like, let's occupy the whole screen. Yeah. Oh, are you able to change it or from your end if you want to see the the full screen you change it from gallery to spotlight you'll be able to see the full screen which one is spotlight i know what gallery is. Uh, okay. yes you are able to see, to see full screen speaker view. yes speaker view. yes change it to speaker view you'll be able to see this demonstration fully okay okay so she's put on her gown. I've helped her tie the, the cords in the front. First, I made mm -hmm. yeah. touching the very, like I just touched the very end, so as not to contaminate her. Then, as the partner, you can tie your patient, the your partner from the back. So the first step when you're using the gown, I mean this form of PPE is the gown. Then the next step is Sorry, the... before you got the next steps, because some people couldn't see. So before donning, you held this from the inside, the, um, the gown from the inside. Um, okay, so Mrs. Um, Makupe, Mrs. Makupe will now put on her mask. We'll demonstrate how to correctly put on an N95 mask, even though we're saying that for now, it's only for the aerosol producing procedures, things like intubating patients, uh, collecting, swab. collecting swabs for now. Which is, I think, the most important one for most of us, isn't it? Because the problem with collecting swabs is if somebody coughs in your face and you're only wearing a surgical mask, then you're going to encounter Problem. So you do need to have an N95 mask in this step when you are collecting actually nasal swab because now you are less than a meter away from the patient. Okay. okay so Mrs. Makupe will help us by showing us how she will put on her N95 mask. So it's very important to put it on correctly. Ideally, you hold it in your hand, like you you can pick it up, and then you cradle it like egg, so to speak. And there's the part with the silver rim that should be on top. Um, the two strings should be, your hands should go between the two. So if you're right handed, you hold it in your right hand, then, sorry, sorry, please. Thank you. So then when you hold it to your face, you'll get the, the, the bottom string and take it to your occiput, and then the top string, you put it on top of the bottom string and then hold it against your nose. Say that again slowly. So she takes it to her face, step one, you get the bottom With your string. other hand, you get the bottom string. The left hand, she's right-handed. And take it to the top of your head. The occiput, just there. And the other string. The top string. Then Excellent. you can just um, massage the metal part just to make sure that it's actually you form fit it yes. to the bridge of the nose. So at this point, for you to know whether an N95 mask is actually properly fitting, it should actually make a proper seal around your chin and around your nose. I think a lot of people who are wearing very big masks, you will see like a huge gap underneath the chin, which kind of defeats the purpose 
a lot i think beards are in fashion right now about fashion. How, what do we do about fashion now the fashion of beards yes cdc actually recommends a clean shave or just a mustache so gentlemen need to shave their beards um even the goatee from mr mm. davis is was amongst those that were not recommended by the cdc they have a whole chart of beards that are yeah, not acceptable Okay, so we put on our N95 mask. Then the next thing we're going to put on is the gloves. Sorry, yeah, is the is the eyewear. So you can actually put on the eyewear and just protect your eyes. Okay. So then my your like if you're the partner, your role is just to make sure that everything is secure. So if we were using the full hooded PPE, your partner would be able to tell that, no, okay, it's too low in my eyes, or it's, um, I can't breathe. Then the other issue with the eyewear, uh, when we demonstrate with the full PPE, you'll be able to, like, it gets fogged up. So there's certain things you can do to prevent the steam um, obstructing your view. Because as you are working with your patients, perhaps you're in a COVID center for two hours. You shouldn't be there for two hours, you should be there for an hour, but you'll still get, our country is hot, so you start sweating. And then if, if you touch your face, remember with COVID, everybody's saying hands away from the face. So I think, yes, Mrs. Makupe, your hands should be as if we're in surgery. So hands up above your face. Not too up like we're arresting you, <laughs> just so that you are not touching the, the table. This is very important. Eh? Healthcare workers are generally younger, but they've experienced the highest mortality just because of us missing out on PPE. And also because we are working so hard during this period, we are not getting enough rest and things like that. That's it's so away from yourself. Just be above the waist mm -hmm. as if we are, um, we are praying. Uh, another nice thing I'd like to point out with her gown is if you can see, it has this nice um, band at the wrist, which is very important because the, like the normal gown is just the material all the way to the wrist. And then when you're working, it can actually start slipping off. So the gowns of this band is very important. If your gown doesn't have this band, what you can do is just using your thumb, you'd make a hole at the edge just to stick your thumb into it so that it doesn't start sticking off as you're doing your duties. And like when you're seeing the patient, you don't really want to be wor worried whether or not you're getting it. Okay, so that being said, then the last thing you need to do is you can put on the gloves. Um, yeah, you, you can actually go ahead and put them. But does it have to be double gloving or single gloving? So that's actually been a contentious issue. Um, in our resource limited setting, it depends again what procedure you're doing. So in our like in our trial center, in our screening center here, we've been using double gloves because sometimes you find maybe you've got five patients who you need to swab, and it's important to maintain hand hygiene between patients. So the purpose there for double glove being is so that between patients you're removing the soiled gloves because you don't really want to be transmitting to different patients. But then additionally, you want to note that if it's just one patient, like in her case, if, if I was the only patient she was swabbing, a single pair of gloves would be adequate. However, if you're in theater or you're trying to intubate a patient, I think double gloving would be recommended. Uh, additionally, depending on when we, when we demonstrate with the other type of PPE, you'll see where double gloving could, could come into play. So now that she's fully done, she can do a little twirl so that we... A twirl. <laughs> She'll be very happy. She's very fashionable, Mrs. Makupe. A little twirl Just with <laughs> your hands up. <laughs> Not too twirly. Yeah. Again, the purpose is, so as the partner, you want to see before someone goes into the infectious area that every the person is properly dressed. With the gown, it's not really that important because the backside is not really covered, yes. so to speak. There are just two points out that one disadvantage is the type of, of t-shirt she's wearing because mm -hmm. that's now gonna, um, you know, have sticky things on it, like a droplet that will stick there and then she takes it home. That's why it's encouraged that when you get home, you actually don't use the same clothes that you are using um, during this period because unfortunately it looks like this, this virus is very contagious. I think something else done, uh, Dr. Duncan has been emphasizing for at least for the registrars is how we shouldn't be wearing things with collars, at least for now, if you're wearing scrubs around neck or a v neck, so that whichever PPE, 
if you find yourself in a situation where you have to be on, what, yes, you don't you have to have that. Okay, so that being said, she now needs, she's done everything, she's worked, she's seen the patients. Uh, now she has to go. Um, yeah, so the first thing that we want to do in terms of doffing is to remove the gloves. But when removing the gloves, there's a special way that you remove them because you don't want, like remember your inside was cleaned and sterile, so to speak, before you went into your patients, but then the outside of the gloves is now contaminated. So what you do is you like scoop, maybe the little gloves. Just a quick reminder, we put out a notice, let us sit one meter apart at the very least. I'm seeing some facilities where we are tight. Um, one meter apart. I know we have said that Zambia has reported three cases, but when you do modeling, actually, it tells you that usually you are just looking at the tip of the iceberg. So let's be, <laughs> <you're> like, <laughs> somebody's laughing. But uh, yes, so we need to make sure we are we keep distance, even in our spokes. Okay, so you'd like pinch the gloves a bit, so that you make a scoop, and then dig your fingers in and then you're turning it out so that the dirty part is contacting the dirty part and you can pull it out but not completely sorry not completely so that you can do the same thing on the other side using the dirty because you've got some dirt on this so scoop it's a bit tricky scoop and then now you can drop them in the waste you, bin yeah in the waste bin and then wash your hands I can see why you have to do that because that little technique right there, it's not very, you know, easy to do. So you could easily get your hands dirty. So you can't say I was clean and then go and eat. Okay. What's so in a facility, like in our case, because we are two, she has a partner. So then as a partner, I would remove the strings. But then in some cases, you won't have the luxury, the luxury of a partner. So you'd actually forfeit that glove removal stage. Am I not to make her put on my glasses? So that she can pull off. Oh. So if you don't have, like, if you have a partner, they just untie you and then you can drop it off. But then if you don't have a partner, you can you just, just pull it, it off, off. And then the gloves will come off with the gum. Because these are disposable anyway. So you're yeah. going to throw them away. So you can rip it off. Okay, a lot of comments. I, I'm wondering if we should go on. No, no, no. I'm sure that we have got a small boardroom. Yeah, I think Corona also appeals to our socioeconomic issues, isn't it? The boardroom is small, so people can't go and attend echo from, from outside. But we do need to keep that in mind for future sessions. Okay, so in the case that you were all by yourself, you had managed to don, you're still wearing your gloves, and you just, from in front, just rip it off. Okay, so Dr. Numa, there's a question here. There's a... Uh, don't you need a plastic apron also in, to in, including the head cap? The hair is at risk of a droplet. With the in one of our later slides, we're going to discuss at which point you use what during what procedures. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> but then make sure you don't touch the inside. The outside is what? And as you're pulling it off, even the gloves should come off. Throw it down. Okay, and just a reminder from Dr. Kakusa. Remember, we're trying to say it should um, fit through. Um, I think we use the word pinch. It's mold with the three tips of fingers to ensure a complete sieve. Why is our disposable cup? Okay. That's how it's there, actually. It's over there. She will go there. Okay. Yes. So the word is mold. Oh, I thought that Mrs. Makuto was going to wash her hands. Because, yes, after removing the gun, your next step is actually washing your hands. Um, very important to always be washing your hands. Yes. And then. Wash your hands. It's quite fun. Okay. Then next, we can remove the goggles. You can touch just the, like, the, what do you call this? The handles. Yes, the handles. Sorry, not the, 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 the Yes, so the bubbles can come off. In most cases, we're using 
reusable ones, so you should have like a chlorine basket, bucket where you can decontaminate them in that. I think it's 0.05% chlorine, but I'm not sure if it's the same. Then lastly would be the removal of the NN5 mask. I know there's like different, there's contentions on, on how best to remove it, but um, the CDC one that we saw was that some people would say you hold the mask and remove it, but then the problem with that is that if your mask is soiled, you're yeah, barehanded, so it means that you're risking contaminating yourself again. So what we would recommend is like you, you grab the, the strings just above your ear, okay. because at least that, if we had been, if we had put the, the hair net, mm -hmm. would have been covered. So you grab the top one first, top one first comes out, and you can drop it. And then the bottom one as well, just from in front of the ear, you can find the string. Then holding it, then you can drop it without having to touch the mask and hair. Yes. And then we drop it in the bin. We really shouldn't be reusing them, but I know we're in a resource limited place. Then the most important step, as Madam Lassina told us, the washing of the hands. So yes, again, we have to wash the hands. Then we'd say that she's correctly dropped. Um, when she gets, if it's like a facility like um, these higher tech facilities, they have showers just outside the screening and treatment area. So you shower and enter change of clothes before getting into your car and going home. In our setting, I don't think we have that. So when you get home, maybe shower immediately there and then change. I think even with the shoes, there's some places where they're using shoe covers, but for the COVID, we're not using shoe covers per se, because we're saying it's profit. Um, so maybe leave your shoes outside before entering your house, because you don't want to, to take infections in the house. Okay. Yes, that's the first step. Okay. Time for the one as well. Yes. Oh, let's see. Um, yes, we could. Okay, maybe we can just go to the part of the, the space. Okay, so anyway, the full space suit. I don't think that's the official name, but yeah. <laughs> Full space suit. Uh, some of the things, remember I had mentioned how the gown had that nice color. With the space suit, they have this little part here, which you would use to like secure your thumb. Um, so that again, the issue of it rolling up and down is here. Then and in the space suit, there's something, when you're using the space suit, that's when you're doing actual like proper, I say the air, like the real nitty gritty of the people in theater and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's where you double gloves. So before putting on the down, you'd start with gloves, which we didn't do. With, before putting on the space, oops, double gloves. You put the first pair of gloves so that then you secure it like that. Then I think there have been questions about the head gear. So with the full space suit, it actually comes complete with the hood. And that's where the role of the partner is very important to make sure that the suit is not uncomfortable. Because if the suit is like in someone's face, then they'll keep touching their face, which is the point at which healthcare workers will get in. So you use this mostly in Ebola eh? yes. for, for contact, and you can only wear them for the half an hour because they are pretty hot. I guess the take home message is practice, practice, practice. I know we forgot the apron because the practice, and the apron is nice because. It's water resistant so that things don't seep in, but you just didn't have that. Okay, so I think this was one of the things that, um, well, this is a nice summary. Thank you very much to my volunteer. Yes, you were a great volunteer. Okay, so in terms of uh, transmission precautions, to know what PPE to use at what point, I think a lot of people have in the different facilities have been having questions on where to wear what. So with the disposable gloves, they are put on at every, like whenever you're in contact with the patient, the disposable gloves are being used. And then there was a question about the disposable apron. So if you're in the ward with suspected um, COVID times, yeah, uh, doing not, there's no, error. like if you're just measuring BP and et cetera, then you can put on the apron. If you're in high risk areas like ICU, 
or in theater or where you need to intubate the patient, then it would depend on the activity that you're doing. Um, then on, when we're doing aerosol generating uh, procedures, things like intubation, they've actually already recommended not using the apron because in that case, we're using the full, what we've been calling the space man suit. Um, then when we get to the disposable gown, that's the one that we started with, when you're in like a place with uh, the suspects, like when we're triaging, you don't actually need the gown. In high dependency areas, it depends on the activity that you're doing. But then if you're doing um, aerosol generating procedures in whatever setting, that's when you need to have your gown. Then in terms of the mask, so the fluid resistant mask, the face mask, the surgical mask basically, you'd use that just for triaging patients. Um, however, if you're in like ICU, theater, or during the aerosol generating procedures, you can see the board red for face masks. Then in that case, that's where we'd recommend for the N95. And then lastly, the eye protection, they said the risk assessment, you do risk assessment for triage and um, in the high dependency units. So that's to say things, um, I think that may change if we're saying that COVID is airborne, then that would probably be when we'll recommend the face shield for everyone. But as at, the, as at now, the assessment is that we don't need the face mask unless we're doing aerosol generating. So the eye protection is very important when you are um, doing aerosol generating procedures and you have to do a lot of risk assessment because that's the closest contact, you know, you touch and you rub your eyes and that's a bit of the problem. So the next important, thank you so much, Dr. Nyuma. I know you have a lot of questions, but we'll get back to that. But thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk about people living with HIV. What do we do now? We need to remember that uh, <laughs> HIV in itself is a pandemic. So we should not lose hope of managing a pandemic that we are really getting a grip of just because we have another one. We need to manage this. And we know mortality is higher with HIV. The investments that have gone into HIV are huge. And actually, we are leveraging a lot from the HIV pandemic investment, such as ECHO. <laughs> ECHO was an HIV investment, but here is COVID using it. Even transporting of specimen, even the, the healthcare workers, it's the same ones. Thank you so much, Kim. Okay. So we'll go to the fourth four question. Okay, yeah, maybe the lead too. So, which of the following is true for ART considerations for COVID nineteen? Providing six month monthly multi month dispensation <laughs> is a way to help reduce congestion at ART clinics. Group health education provided in waiting rooms at ART clinics is discouraged during this outbreak. Recipients of care should be educated on COVID-19 and should call the facility if they develop any flu-like symptoms. And there is all the above. Which of these is true? So I'm sure Keith has had a look at you, educators further. Is it that all of them are true? Is it that only A is true? Okay, MMD, multi mass dispensation, is a way to reduce congestion. Okay, group health education is actually now discouraged because of the current outbreak. Recipients of care should be educated about COVID 19 and should call the facility if they develop any flu like symptoms. And then there's all the above. Thank you. Which statement is true? People living with HIV with chronic medical conditions may be at risk of severe COVID-19. Consideration for reducing clinic visits among recipients of care should not be considered as ART sites prepare for COVID-19. Let's go ahead and poll. We've just launched the poll. Which is true? Is it A or B? People, sorry. Which of the, which is not true? Oh, I think, thank you. Which is not true? Which one is a lie? 
it's not good. <laughs> People living with HIV with chronic medical conditions may be at risk of severe COVID-19. Considerations for reducing clinic visits among recipients of care should not be considered as ART sites prepare for COVID-19. Which of the following is not true? Keith, even I'm finding this hard because of the notes, but I guess <laughs> you explain, okay? So should we not make any considerations for reducing clinics? Because should we be rigid? This is where DSD comes into play. Flexible, flexible, flexible. Let's not put patients at risk. So, hey, thank you very much. <clears throat> so public health measures for COVID-19, we are really focusing on preventing infections with, uh, as well as detecting any infection through enhanced uh, surveillance and access finding. Uh, and when we find those cases, we respond appropriately. So for people living with HIV, uh, the clinical cause of COVID-19 is not yet known. As you are aware, the eight cases that started in China were prevalence of HIV. So we are learning as we are going. So a lot of things uh, are coming on board and, uh, and evidence is being updated. But what is known this far about COVID-19 is that severe disease has been observed among the elderly, especially those above 60, those with underlying medical conditions such as hypertension, uh, pulmonary disease, as well as conditions related to immunosuppression, e.g., diabetes, cancer, renal disease. So, based on lessons learned from other coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS, it is assumed that severe disease among PLHIV with low CD4 count, and here we are talking about less than <coughs> cells per meal, as well as those living with HIV but not yet on treatment, not yet on ARG. Uh, assumed uh, possible to develop. It is based on how uh, other corona related viruses progressed in people with HIV. So, having said that, a provision of ART services must continue while maintaining a safe environment for clients and staff. What Joshua was saying, the gains that we have made as a program, uh, getting close to the control, not slip away, even as we are managing the uh, a COVID pandemic. The measures can help uh, ensure high quality care for recipients of care as more information becomes available as, ev as evidence is emerging. Prevention in ART clinics, uh, we have already spoken about frequent hand hygiene is key to prevention. So we are asking that uh, ART uh, clinics prepare AIC related the hand washing posters health talks and audiovisual. Provide soap and water, uh, where we have a functional tub, a bucket tub. Where water is not available, we have today that we can use hand sanitizer. And at the seat level, we are able to uh, make our own hands. For cough, anti provide IEC materials, provide tissue and bin uh, to dispose, as well as the uh, for patient isolation and infection prevention, try it, coughing patients or patients with vector symptoms, the seen test or isolated as the case may be, as they are represented. Then keep windows open to ensure uh, good ventilation in screening rooms as well as in waiting areas. Continuing on on prevention in ART clinics, we need to avoid touching of face with unclean hands. Here we need to provide IEC materials. So ZNPHI has already uh, uh, finalized those materials. They are available now in both English and local languages. So uh, treatment partners can access those materials, print and share with the ART clinics. And for social distancing, we really need to practice this, provide the materials so that even uh, recipients of care as they go home, they also have an understanding of what this is it applies even at community level. Then ensure waiting area supports spacing. Here we have said at least greater than one meter since we have those options, WHO and CDC. And then rational appointment system. This is really the key part of this presentation. ART clinics can be very congested. 
This is where we need now to operationalize the rational appointment system, where we have day and time. And here, what we are saying is this should happen now. You might uh, want to, uh, to remember that, for example, the patients we are seeing on Monday, we have already booked them for Monday and we told them to come in the morning. We need to be active. Now we need to start calling recipients of care and giving them time allocations for that Monday. We are advising that you be seeing at least five patients every 30 minutes. So you give them time blocks, five per 30 minutes, and you book them through the entire working day from morning to 16 hours. So what we are advising, so that we start addressing the issue of congestion now. And the, in, in line with that, we should suspend the group health education that we do in the morning where everyone meets in the common waiting area because that usually doesn't work because of the congestion and the numbers that we open in those waiting areas. So that should be suspended immediately. Patients should start coming in few groups of five, as we call them. And then as we book them going forward now, we operationalize the rational. Then early isolation of uh, uh, recipients of care with the suspected infection, uh, identify and prepare space in case need arises. So we are encouraging facilities to have a room at least they have identified where if they see a case among recipients of care, they can at least take them to that body as everything else is being done. And then keep face masks in handy for yeah. to provide appropriate PPD healthcare workers at ART clinics in case we have a case and we need a correct sample. So special considerations for people living with HIV. We are advising that we provide six months dispensation because we know when we do this, we are going to decongest the clinic. We know that some facilities have issues with commodities, but we're also aware that within our districts, there are facilities that are overstocked. Some of them even with eight months of stock, some of them more than 10 months of stock. So we need to work with the district and the provincial pharmacies to ensure that through the distribution and from national level, they are able to ensure that commodities come your way. Uh, and we are saying that uh, we should also include children who are eligible. We know that the DSD guidelines, children were not included, but they are being updated, and this, this guidance will be shared very short. Then, STAG-IRT clinic appointments, this speaks to rational appointment system, as well as uh, poor recipients of care to schedule time and explain the reasoning that we don't want everyone to come in the morning. People go in the morning at 06 and everyone is congested there. Once we explain the reasoning, then we can have people come in the facility, they just spend 30, 40 minutes, they are out. And then make available and display the ART clinic number that the recipients of care can call in case of symptoms before they come to the facility. They should call so that the healthcare workers are related and they are expected to be there. And then to make arrangements for the collection of ART because where possible, uh, the, the clinic should live in ART compliance in the community because we are trying to, as much as possible, reduce congestion. So, if you have a model like mobile ART where you can go in the community and distribute ART, that is also encouraging. Uh, include information, uh, uh, information materials to advise recipients of care who have respiratory symptoms go ahead so that the clinic is aware, as well as ART clinic staff are able to separate patients from other, other patients because that present you see. ART clinic staff should immediately provide face masks for any recipient of care who come with respiratory symptoms. And then we need to adhere to MOH guidelines for prevention of COVID-19. I'm sure we all have received now the guidance from MOH for ART providers who are unwell or if she takes sick leave stay at home because we don't want to be the ones now infecting them. ART providers and recipients of care should practice frequent and hygiene, including before and after patient care, when coming into contact with secretions, as well as after using the toilet. And just to emphasize that the sick, the staying home should be accompanied with a sick not fight by the supervisor, not Thank just you. to stay home because we don't want everyone now to just be home. Then, uh, so to just try and summarize uh, everything we have discussed, we are saying hand washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, the most important thing that we're going to ensure we have to uh, preventing COVID. Uh, avoid touching eyes, 
nose and mouth with unwashed hands, cover, cough, or sne uh, sneeze with tissue, then throw it in the bin. Where tissue is not available, we are advising that uh, the coughing is done into a, a fixed elbow and not uh, on the hand. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. Avoid close contact with people who are tested more than a meter even if they are tried. And please stay home. Okay. Thank you so much. Keith, as we've had one more than one meter, if we can join in via our devices, we are actually encouraging for people to do this and not use them the spokes if they cannot sit at least more than one meter apart. Okay. So we will take a few comments before we go back to the four questions. Uh Chetonda, I can't see the comments. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Cassidy. Thank you for the excellent presentation so far. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, the triage is very important and I think that's also rapidly, you know, has potential to rapidly change as we see if community transmission occurs or, or what happens as the epidemic evolves, uh, those guidelines may change. So keep, uh, keep updated, keep posted on how, we're, how people are being screened. Uh, two for PPE, uh, it's personal protective equipment is very critical for the healthcare workers. Re please remember all of you that you are critical in this fight. This is really um, our, our call to action. This is a way we can help Zambia and everywhere in the world, the healthcare workers are on the front line and and helping humanity respond to this crisis. So it's important that you keep yourself safe. Uh, please do practice very careful personal protection with the equipment so that you maintain your own health and that you're able to help the next patient that comes in. Um, so, so one thing to consider is if you're on the front line if you, and you have a beard like me, please consider shaving it or at least uh, coming down to the uh, <coughs> areas covered by the PPE so that you have a good fit of the respirator or the, the mask. I can't read. And then, um, and then in addition, there's some evidence that the pers that healthcare workers are best protected when they take continuous precautions at all times. So please, you know, when we do, if it should happen that we have widespread COVID in Zambia, please take a lot of precautions for yourself. And finally, we're looking into some options to provide some uh, cloth masks and so forth for the hospitals. So we'll keep you updated on those uh, proposals as they move along. Those are into my comments. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Cassidy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We were wondering about there is something that uh, we came across that saying that um, we had thought initially that COVID-19 was by droplet spread. Any comment on this article? We still can find it on the fact that it may be airborne. And what's the difference? How do they go about it? Because I know someone was like, I don't even know why they said this thing was not airborne when it's coming from the car. You want to elaborate? <clears throat> yeah, it's a very good question. So, you know, droplet, droplets are things that can be spread on surfaces. Droplets are, are heavy particles that are briefly aerosolized and can be transmitted by uh, close contact or um, via surfaces. Uh, aerosolization means that these are small particles that are suspended in the air and can hang there for some time. So when something is aerosolized, it can just be, it can be passed basically by breathing contaminated air which is concerning and that's part of the reason why we're endorsing this two meter uh, rule and why, why particularly people who are infected, people who do have symptoms themselves should wear a mask because that prevents them from expelling their secretions out into the air and helps protect the community around them. So I think it's important to emphasize that this is a community effort and we need to all be involved. So if you do become sick, you should wear a mask yourself to prevent transmission. And that's where the role of these cloth masks may come uh, largely into play. Thank you, that's very helpful. Are there any 
questions before we go to the chat. Tatonda, you can unmute any question. Though there's something I think I wanted to respond to it in response to one of our poor questions. Dr. Onoya, please unmute yourself and uh, make your comments or contribution. Dr. Philip Onoya from Chilenje Clinic, or I think he may be joining via personal device. His argument was that he does not agree that um, hand washing is the most important effective way of uh, preventing transmission of infections like COVID-19. Do you have any comment for that, Dr. Kasi? Uh, uh, sir, what's your, what are you arguing is, uh, is the most important thing to do? Washing your hands. And sorry, what is the, the question, questioner asking? Uh, is it, what is the most important thing in order, in order to prevent transmission of infectious diseases? Is it hand washing or there is something that's more critical? I know it's a lot of things like uh, covering your face when you're coughing, yeah. but what's the most critical thing in terms of infectious diseases? I think it's Onoya's argument. Yeah, so absolutely, hand, hand washing is 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 absolutely critical. Um, you know, I think there there's a whole package of interventions we need to employ in order to limit the spread of COVID. I mean, we're screening travelers coming in at the clinic. We're recognizing people with epidemiologic risk. Uh, those are those are you know health system interventions that that are very important. I think if you are aware of someone with symptoms, that the social distancing is really important. And the reason why is that it takes, but by doing so, by doing social distancing, by limiting our interaction with each other, we are preventing rapid spread of the virus. Now, we may still all get the virus at some point in time, but if we slow down the spread of the virus, it means we don't overwhelm the health system at one time, which means that you know the ventilators or oxygen or anything else that's available, it can be used in, it can, we don't overwhelm that capacity. And so we, we, we take on what we need. Um, I think in addition, uh, but, but from person to person, the, the most important thing you can do as an individual is to wash your hands. Because you, if you are infected, you prevent transmission to others. Uh, more importantly, if you're not infected, as the vast majority of us are not, it prevents you from, if you've touched something that may be contaminated, uh, from transmitting it to yourself or to others. Remember that we touch things and then we touch our face uh, multiple, multiple times in an hour. And so that puts us at risk for acquisition via mucous membranes. Uh, I think there's a lot of important interventions for us to take as a community to prevent spread of, the, of this disease. But if I had to pick one single most important thing, it would be regular and routine washing of your hands, particularly at the health facilities when you enter. And then you can, and, you know, in the stores and everywhere else where you go, we're putting hand washing stations out in front of them. So please continue to employ that. Thank you so much. I believe we really should have been, should be doing these things even without COVID-19. I think that's why we, we tend to relax and we have pandemics. We wash our hands, it goes away, makes it to be cholera, but hand washing is really the, a very big uh, proven intervention. Dr. Kakusa, please go ahead with your contribution. Dr. Manja Kakusa, please go ahead with your contribution. Good afternoon. Hi, Hi Manja, how are you? Good. The first comment maybe is on the issue of uh, social interaction. I've seen like a lot of um, encouraging of elbow bumping as a form of greeting. But when you look at our cough etiquette advice, they are encouraging people to cough into the bend of the elbow, and then the next thing they are bumping each other on the elbow. I think it will be important to change the message so that we completely eliminate contact during greeting. Then I have a question. I think something for consideration as the number of cases grows. What is the plan for healthcare workers who will be looking after these patients? Do we need to? deliberately come up with a policy on um, how these healthcare workers will be taken care of in terms of isolation. As we know, they may be drivers of infection within their families and within the healthcare setting to other patients. That's all. 
thank you so much, Dr. Kakusa. Um, I think the other one is a valid comment. We know that contact of war forms can lead to to spread. I don't know, Keith, if you want to contribute before we go to the second question, because I know we've been managing levy in a certain way, so maybe we can give you an example of that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Say that if we need minimize contacts. I have seen where people uh, are encouraging that the greeting should just be touching your own chest, like, hi, how are you, as opposed to having contact. So I think that's probably where we need to move on to break the messaging. I think the elbow thing didn't come from the public health approach, it came from the community, but we need to correct that. Thank you. Yes. But I'm, I'm also wondering, why do you think people do not take their quarantine seriously? I think this is for a behavioral expert, actually, isn't it a question? I think there's been a lot of concerns that a lot of people who are supposed to be self-quarantining are breaking it. Do you want to comment on that? Please, have you heard that anywhere? Yeah, so I think that it's a, it's a behavioral thing, and maybe at the beginning of the epidemic, people don't not <laughs> take anything seriously. We have we saw that article from from Italy where people now are beginning to think that from the beginning, if they did what they are doing now, the epidemic would, have, well, would not have gotten where it is. So just taking things seriously, if, if people have been advised to self-quarantine at home, to, uh, they are not going into shopping malls and shopping, just staying at home and staying in touch with national office, that's how they are doing until they are cleared after the 14 days window. I think that's, that's very important. We have been hearing some some stories around this. Some people calling wanting to go to the shop, but the team at the National Public Health Institute is really big to yourself. Because the unfortunate thing is that you may have no symptoms, but you have potential to transmit. You may be young and fit, but we need to be considerate that we have a huge HIV population in our country. So let's be considerate of, of others. So I'm trying to allow Prof. Lloyd to join in to answer the second question, but we'll go to him when he comes in. Uh, Valentin, please go ahead with your contribution. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I just want to find out, uh, do we have uh, any, uh, uh, like um, the test that we can do, rapid test for COVID-19 at the moment? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. We were discussing that this morning. Our, uh, Dr. Cassie, did you want to pick that one up? Are we, are, do we have any rapid tests like antigen and antibody tests, FDA approved or otherwise that we can consider? I guess he's saying this in the way that maybe the swabs may not be available countrywide as, as yet. So I'm aware that there is a gene expert test that has a rapid turnaround of 45 minutes, which is about the closest we're going to get to uh, a point of care test that's just been announced on Saturday. Um, but in terms of the, and I believe there's an effort to get those in country, but in terms of discussion of the actual availability of, of, of test kits, that's not within, I don't have that information. Maybe someone else on the call can take that up. Okay, I think Prof has joined us, so I think you can pick up that one in terms of test kits and when we'll have these rapid tests, if they are there, I know there's IgG, IgM, IgG, there's yes. antigen tests, you can even test your stool. But the question, Prof, is what plan do we have in place for healthcare workers that are attending to COVID-19 patients? Because I'm aware you have to cycle them that they get some days of others coming. How are you managing it at Levy? I know you've been seeing the patients at Levy. Yeah, so um, maybe let me just add up to what Dr. Gassi said. We currently are planning for the cassettes to use for the gene expert. And uh, this is in um, support of a CDC. Then also, we have uh, an antigen rapid test as well, which we may have in the country maybe in the next two weeks or so. We have not yet considered uh, the antibody based uh, for both IgG and also IgM, um, but we have had, of course, a lot of requests coming into the ministry. Uh, but as you know, we, we have to regulate on uh, which tests are we using, and uh, we 
actually they have to depend on, especially those that have at a minimum the FDA approval. We are not waiting for WHO qualification. So likely in the coming week, uh, maybe in the next coming one month, we should have uh, uh, the cartridges for the gene expert and also we should have uh, the antigen-based uh, testing, uh, which will have a turnaround time of about 30 minutes or so. Then for the health workers, currently we have about 22 nurses who are doing shifts here at Levy. We have uh, four environmental health technicians. Also, we have some, I think about three maids as well, then uh, three biomedical engineers, and uh, right now one doctor, although the doctor is not um, um, quarantined there, so to say. We are giving them a shift of um, two weeks. After two weeks, they are 15, they do a shift of two weeks, then after two weeks, we maintain them under observation or quarantine, so to say, for 14 days. Uh, after 14 days, we have uh, we allow we are supposed to be allowing them home. Then they come back again um, after two weeks. So the days when we are observing them, the 14 days when we are observing them, they are still uh, in the isolation facility. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Lloyd. Dr. Kakusa, is that um, is that clear, or would you like further clarification? Dr. Chambwa, you have a comment? Please go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks. Just two quick comments. One was uh, what Dr. Mbewa was mentioning earlier about uh, what quarantine means. Um, so as an example, I think she mentioned that uh, quarantine means um, the individual together with their family. And uh, that's what I'm practicing right now. But to answer the question on aerosol generation, so there was a study um, last week, uh, I think it was people from National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAD, uh, it was a New England journal, where they were comparing SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, and they wanted to compare um, the aerosols for both of those viruses. Basically, their conclusion was that uh, after doing some experiments, uh, they said that their results indicated that aerosol and formal transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is plausible uh, since it remains viable um, as an aerosol for hours. And then on the surfaces, uh, it can remain viable for several days. So the implication of that is that um, in nosocomial situations, um, that can be a means of spread. And then they also talk about super spreading events. So I can share that article later. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned the super, super spreading events. I know South Korea, <laughs> when they reached patient 30, things were okay. Then the 31st patient was actually their super spreader that caused their outbreak to go out of control. So it only takes one person to not do the right thing. So as I think Dr. Cassidy said, it's all our responsibility. We need to educate a lot of our public I think there's a lot of misconception that black people cannot get corona, this COVID. Uh, Idris Alba, last time I checked, is a very black man. He's currently in isolation because he had actually COVID-19. So we can all get it. Um, we'll take, um, please go ahead with your question. I can see a hand, Chatonda. Mwembeshi, please unmute and go ahead. Um, but Lucy Zulu is asking Prof. Lloyd, because I know we were discussing this this morning, okay. what medication Okay, just, just mute them. Uh, Prof. Lloyd, Lucy is asking a question. What medications are being given to the patients? Since we've heard all sorts of things, what medications are we giving to these patients that we are looking after in Yemi? Is Prof. still on? Uh, Dr. Fowler, professor has left the room. Okay. Okay, we can wait for him to come back, but we'll take other questions. Just, just let him know that there's another question for him. What medications we are using for the patients at, at Levy? Mwembeshi, are you ready for us now? Yes. Please go ahead with your contribution. Uh, we wanted just to find out on the... 
Now this time that you were showing us, you showed us that most of the people should not let us ever be put on this expansion of the hospital in the islands. And the challenge comes in where because our clinics, most of them are fully packed. So what did we consider in putting them on six uh, months in the day? And the question comes in to say, uh, most of the, uh, our pharmacies are not well stocked in terms of uh, air articles other than the jobs for them to answer. So we don't know how we can make it those returns. That's a very good question. I think his comment is um, the pharmacies are not well stocked. So how do they give out these six months? His other question was we have a lot of patients. So how do we decongest? Is that what he said, David? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, we'd like to start uh, addressing the issue of the congesting the clinic. So if you go to ART clinics, you find all the patients booked for that day come in the morning. They arrive, some of them at six, and they are there uh, throughout the day until they are probably seen 11, 12. That's when you, you start seeing the numbers going down. So the first step that clinics needs to do is book patients by day and time. So those patients who are booked next week, for example, for Monday, we need to start calling them, phoning them now, uh, to tell some of them to come, for example, at eight hours, some of them to come at nine, some at 10, some at 11, we should book them throughout the ART working day up to 16 hours. That way we are going to have fewer number of patients coming in every hour and they will be staying for fewer minutes in the facility. And then for six months dispensation, yes, we hear your concern, uh, but we have also noted that when we look at uh, the site level, uh, commodities. There are facilities within districts that are overstocked. Uh, so we, we want uh, facilities to work with the district pharmacy and provincial pharmacy so that they can do the distribution. Even as at national level, they are bringing in more commodities to ensure we operationalize the six months. Okay, thank you very much. We will let uh, we'll allow another question. Is there any hand up? Chadonda? Okay, is Prof back in ACOE to ask about the medication? I don't want to preempt it, but because we have a session that's looking at all the evidence that has come out through, through this. Uh, but Dr. Cassidy, any comments about the possible medications for patients for as prophylaxis and treatment? So this is a very interesting area, a very interesting question. Let me suffice to say no medications have been proven to work at this point in time. Uh, there has been, there was initially some excitement around lopinavir and ritonavir, but there was a randomized controlled trial published in New England Journal that showed no effect. Uh, there's, of course, been a lot of talk around chloroquine and azithromycin based on a study out of France. However, if you actually read that paper, there's actually a lot of problems with it. So the patients in the intention to treat, the tr intention to treat arm, those who received the, the medication, uh, about five of them were censored, so meaning removed. Uh, this has the potential to inflate the effect, and when those are put back in, there's actually no treatment effect. So suffice it to say that at this point in time, nothing has been proven to work. Everything is experimental. Please don't go out and hoard or, or drugs uh, that may be needed for other reasons, such as malaria or pneumonia and so forth. Um, I think the whole world is watching to see, and I think many scientists around the world are pushing aggressively on, uh, on this to see what can be found, and I mean, everyone is holding their breath, so there's a lot of interest and a lot of effort. But, um, but as for now, there's nothing that's been proven to work, which is, of course, part of the problem and why, why we are in a worldwide pandemic. Okay, and that's helpful, because I know one of the big drugs people are talking about is uh, chloroquine. Any comments specifically on, on chloroquine? I know that they've admitted a couple of patients in Nigeria because of overdose of chloroquine. And, but we need to remember, if you are fit, really, you need to get, you really should be fine as long as you quarantine and self-isolate. So there's no need for the panic. Please go ahead. Absolutely. So as with any drug, there are side effects and it must be taken with caution. So chloroquine is a QT, it has a risk of prolonging the, the QT, um, so, which is a, a part of the heart rhythm. So it has the potential for causing fatal 
heart ryth uh, rhythms, especially when it's used in conjunction with azithromycin, which is what was recommended in that study, which is also a QT prolonger. So taken together, they have some significant effects on the heart. Um, they can have other effects such as uh, dermatitis, like itchiness or photosensitivity, and, and cause also severe burn-like um, breakouts, bullous eruptions. So chloroquine is a, it, it's generally a well-used, safe, tolerable drug, but it has potential side effects. It should not be taken as prophylaxis. Um, currently, it's under investigation for use in severe COVID. So if you're diagnosed with COVID and severe, we, it would be considered for usage, but I would not recommend using it empirically and certainly not for prophylaxis as some people seem to be doing. And again, the okay. study is very much in question that showed some potential benefit. Okay. Now there was a question about the stock status, but I know that conversations have already started happening to make sure that we push in the drugs into the facilities. And please bear in mind, TLE for those that are on TLE should be continued. Only those that are starting TLD should start it because we also want to safeguard the stock status that we have now. We do not want to let the TLE go to waste because we don't know how much drug we'll get in, especially with this pandemic. So if you're on TLE, we continue um, the TLE. Those with transi transition, continue the TLD. Um, there's a question, Keith, here, and I think maybe Dr. Newman can assist. Kindly elaborate more on the CDC for guidelines regarding provision of appropriate PPEs for healthcare workers, the clinical area. What would you consider appropriate PPE in an ART, assuming really there's no COVID or you may get a suspect? Thank you very much. I think this fits with what Dr. Mbewe presented. So for, for areas where uh, we are doing triage, we're just talking about to uh, uh, surgical masks, and then if you have cases and you may need to procedures that generate aerosols. That's why I need the full clear. But I think the question is speaking to with regards to what's the paper guidance with regards to maybe implementing partners' ability to support ART clinics with these PPEs. I think there are discussions to have uh, implementing partners support ART clinics. And my advice would be uh, 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 the implementing partners to get in touch with their lead team manager or, or TRs so that they can get guidance. We have already started procure some PPEs for ART clinics. Okay, thank Because sometimes it is labs they run out want to ensure mm -hmm. that they have what they need. Thank you so much, Keith. I think we are now going to go back and um, get comments on our poll questions. So, uh, poll question one, which of the following is not true? Okay. Um, Madam Lastina, I think this one is yours. Healthcare workers should, no, this one is yours, Dr. Numa. Healthcare workers should don PPE when triaging patients in an ERT clinic. Healthcare workers should be seated at least one to two meters from recipients of care. If the suspect patients with acute respiratory illness and medical mask or individuals entering the triage area should observe hand hygiene. Remember, we're looking for the thing that's not true. Do you want to comment? What would you, which one? It's a hundred when one person has voted. Change now, I'm sure it should be. <laughs> okay. uh, so the question was, um, which of the following is not true? And um, I think the, the, the false one is the first one that says healthcare workers should do a full PPE when triaging patients in the ART clinic. Um, like we mentioned, the full PPE is including the gown, the mask, the goggles, um, if you're triaging a patient from two meters away, you don't really need to put on all that. And in our resource limited setting, we run the risk of running out of PPE before the, the pandemic can actually fully take its um, effect. Okay, but they should always have masks handy yes. in case they have somebody that comes in coughing so that the, the patient is given mask. So the, this one is false, not because we are saying people should not wear PPE, because of the extent of PPE that you you need to, to wear. I'll tell you, we had a, an initial problem because when the nurse calls and says, I've got a suspected COVID, our registrar panics, whereas the whole PPE goes there and finds that it's, uh, 
it's something else like a pulmonary embolism where you don't need any any ppe so we encourage that if you can talk to these patients uh extensively on the phone it will help you gauge how much ppe you should use otherwise we use we we'll end up with a lot of wastage of this ppe and we know well over it's actually running out so madam lastin actually i think we skipped the question somebody asked you, can you tell us the formula again for how to make i noticed it was one to three parts one part this are in three parts methylated spirit they asked for the formula and they are saying which of the following okay, so the formula is simply one Camera. part of glycerin, part of the glycerin. We need the alkyl of this because this is what we need. Microorganism, while as the glycerin avoids or prevents the skin from being burnt. Because looking at the, the number of times you have to do this, really, you are risking your skin. So that's why you need that glycerin. So she has said it's one to three parts, one part methylate glycerin, mm -hmm. three parts of the methylated spirit. Let's remember that hand sanitizer should minimum have 60% alcohol. Unfortunately, I've seen most of our hand sanitizers, they just tell you the Q 99.9% of the of the gems. So, but we'll presume that Corona is one of those. So what's the answer here, uh, Madam Lastina? So the answer is that we need to wash hands because that's the reason why we say Zambia is in our hands. Everything that we do involves hands. The washing with your hands, you're eating with your hands. When you are changing babies at home, you're using your hands. When you're attending to a patient, you are using your hands. So hands are, I think they are versatile. You know, we need the hands to do almost everything. And that's why they are at risk of picking infections or microorganisms as we go around our everyday way. So if we wash hands, we definitely uh, go a long way into, especially in the hospitals, uh, preventing nosocomial infection. So the answer is true there. Hand washing is the most important procedure to limit the spread of infections such as COVID-19. I know we have some unbelievers that are saying that this is not true, but we need to remember, even if they are saying it may be an airborne disease, mostly it is droplets. And what happens to droplets, the fall on formites and things like phones. So you touch them. You don't necessarily have to breathe those droplets in. So we are touching everything. That's why it's really the most important. It's not the only, but it's the most important. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go to them. They said, oh, uh -huh, maybe. okay, so this is how people voted. Um, I would like, where is the third poll? Help me with the third poll. Okay, so, okay, I found it. Okay. So the third question was, which of the following is appropriate IPC for COVID-19 patients in healthcare settings. So this is in the healthcare setting. Perform hand hygiene before and after contact with patients and contaminated surfaces. Okay, which one? So it's um, always use a particulate respirator when performing aerosol generating procedures. That's uh, B by a particulate respirator, something like N95. Apply contact precautions at all times, and there's all the above. Very few people are voting. We have 106 participants with only 18 willing to give an opinion on this opinion. <laughs> Important part. Okay, so Keith, would you like to? Or is it you, new map? Um, okay, so I think all of the above is the correct answer. Seeing as every well, I don't know what I'm supposed to comment, seeing as the majority, yes, the majority kind of running. Sorry, okay, so the correct answer is all of the above. You need to perform hand hygiene before and after each contact with patients, and you always use a particular 
a particular an N95 when you are performing aerosol generating procedures such as intubating. And all the time, you need to apply your contact precautions all the time. So please don't get tired of, of washing your hands. I know there's also behavioral aspects in what we are used to doing. Okay, so we we'll go to the fourth calling question. This is for kids. Which of the following is true for ART considerations? This is the second last. We are just about to be end our session. Which of the following is true for ART considerations? Should we provide uh, a six monthly multi month dispensation as a way to reduce, reduce congestion in our clinics? Um, group health education provided in waiting rooms at ART clinics is discouraged during COVID 19. Recipients of care should be educated on COVID-19 and should call the facility if they develop any flu like symptoms. Thank you very much. I see that uh, all those that have gotten the answer correct, so the answer is all the above. All the three there are applicable. Thank you so much. I know there was a question on six months multi-month uh, dispensation, but I know we are pushing drug into facilities mm -hmm. so that the, all those that are not don't have enough stock, you have to have enough stock so that really we have people staying home and not having to come to the clinic. I think we'll wind up with the, the last question. I've seen Wantula, you raised your hand. Feel free to type it in because we are actually closing. So our fifth question is, which is of the following is true? People living with HIV with chronic medical conditions may be at risk of severe COVID-19, which of is not true. <laughs> Consideration for reducing clinic visits among recipients of care should not be considered as ART size prepare for COVID-19. Which one is not the truth? Which one is false? Are we saying that people living with HIV are not at risk of chronic medical at, at uh, of severe COVID-19, or are we saying that um, uh, there should not be considerations to reduce uh, visits in our ART clinic? That's how people have voted to end the poll. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, here we are looking for uh, an answer which is not true. So the second option is not true. The first one is true. Actually, we are saying just like the general public, even PLHIV, if they have underlying medical conditions that have diabetes, hypertension, they are also at increased risk of developing severe disease. Then the second one is, is not true because we actually want to put consideration congestion. Because we know if we are congested and we have a case that is risk for break, so we want to be congested as much as that's why we are advocating for six months. That's why we are asking that we put the patients according to times and not ask all of them to come in the morning at once. We want them to come in groups of five, five, and see them every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith. I know that the congestion has been a priority for the Ministry of Health and our supporting partners, but at this point, it moves from being priority to being red. It's an emergency that we decongest this these facilities because depending on how the outbreak um, evolves, we may need to go into drastic measures. So it's a priority, it remains a priority, but now more than ever, it's crucial that we decongest our facilities to protect ourselves and our patients. For people living with HIV, there have been a few case reports where we've seen severe infections. We got some examples from the SARS and from the nurse, especially for our patients with low CD4 count. Unfortunately, we need to end our discussion here. On Monday, we'll be discussing COVID again, so you can hold on to those questions and uh, join us. We'll be discussing some of the literature that has come out of China almost every day, and Italy, actually, these other countries. We are having evidence coming out on COVID. What are we finding out? Just today, Dr. Chamba was telling us that it's plausible this disease may be airborne. So we'll see you next Monday, but tomorrow, please tune in at nine o'clock for the commemoration of World TB Day. It's nine hours, Shatonda. At nine o'clock for commemoration of World TB Day at 10 hours.
for 10 hours. So please join our, our TB team. And fortunately, we are not doing it in person. It's going virtual. So this platform will be able to house that meeting. We'll see you on Monday. And we'll, talk, we'll be looking at all the literature that has come out. What is true, what is not true, because we tend to get excited. Vitamin C, we raid the shops. Vitamin C, tissue, we raid the shops. So we'll see you next time. And thank you so much for patience. Keep safe and let's keep all our clients safe.